Good afternoon. My name is Karen Planet. I'm the president of AI Ohio, here to welcome you to today's program, Beyond AIA 2030, Reducing Embodied Carbon. This is the second in a series of six workshops focused on practice innovation that will be presented by AI Ohio each week. I would first like to recognize and thank our 2021 AI Ohio annual sponsors highlighted on the screen now. Our sponsors are important partners who have helped us bring the innovative and quality program we are enjoying this year. I would also like to thank our chair of the Practice Innovation Committee, Melinda Scalfaro, and committee members, Emily Little, Bruce Sikanik, Bill Willoughby, Kate, and Kate Brunswick for developing the programs for this series. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours, including some time for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. During the presentation, please make sure your microphone is on mute so everyone can hear. And towards the end of the presentation, remember we'll be placing a link in the chat box, which you can click on to receive your learning units for today's program. Uh, this is a quick look at our upcoming programs. Next, the next practice innovation workshop is titled Alternative Project Delivery Message Methods. If you haven't registered for future workshops in the series, you can do so at AIOhio.org. You will need to register for each session in this series individually. So for today's program, we're featuring two speakers, Shell Anderson with LMN Architects and Vaslav Haslik with Building Transparency. AI Ohio's Practice Innovation Committee Chair, Melinda Scalfaro, AIA, will be moderating the discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Melinda to introduce our presenters for today's program. Melinda. Thanks, Karen. Let me share my screen here. So as Karen mentioned, my name is Melinda Scalfaro. I'm the AIA Akron, AIA Akron representative to the AIA Ohio board. And thanks everyone for joining us for our second workshop in the practice innovation series. Um, we have a great session planned for today and with two individuals with a vast amount of knowledge and expertise to share with you all. But before we get started, we want to make sure everyone's awake. So can you all see my screen okay? Let's see. Yep. So. Can't see your Okay. So before we get started, we want to make sure everyone's awake and kind of get a temperature on um, everyone's background knowledge on this, this um, topic. So you can see I follow Bill Willoughby's uh, theme of incorporating memes. So um, Kate, if you could launch, we've got a quick poll if everyone could take that really quickly. Um, we just kind of want to see where everyone's at. And while you do that, I'll kind of go through the learning objectives for this presentation. Um, so you can see those on the screen uh, when you're done taking the poll. If you've just joined, uh, we've got a, some poll questions up. Go ahead and um, take the poll. We've got about 70% on the meeting have done so. We'll just give it maybe like one more minute, Kate, and if you can then share the results of the poll.
All right. So can everyone see those results okay? Hopefully. So first question was how much experience do you have with embodied carbon? So we have 15% say what's embodied carbon, 70% has heard it at a presentation, 11% someone at my practice and has worked on it and actually very surprising, 0% have run an embodied carbon analysis. Um, and then you can see 7% have used it in strategies and specs. So what, what do you wanna get out of today's section? Be converse, more conversant about embodied carbon, start embodied carbon analysis at our practice, uh, 30% expand our embodied carbon practice, 15%. That's very interesting. Ask some basic questions, 4%, and ask detailed questions, 7%. And then if your firm has analyzed embodied carbon, which tools have been used? And then we've got 93% with no tools used, 7% other. And then have you ever read an environmental product declaration or EPD? 52% um, say what's an EPD? And then the rest have either once or twice uh, at 33% and then frequently if, at 15%. So very interesting. I think it's definitely, um, you know, one of the reasons we identified this as, as a session is because we do feel that, you know, this is, uh, a sector of practice that it needs to be um, looked at more carefully in Ohio and that, you know, we're kind of lagging behind the rest of the country on this. So you can see we kind of gone, have had the learning objectives up there, but why is this important? Um, you know, before I introduce our presenters, let's talk a little bit about this. I'm sure we're all painfully aware the effects of climate change are already apparent. Um, the IPCC, which is the United Nations body um, on climate change, had it was recent, recently published a 1300 page scientific report and showing that each of the last four decades has been successfully warmer than any decade that preceded it. And it also outlines that there's still a short window to stop things from getting even worse. You know, we've long been focused on doing our part to help reduce the environmental impact of the built environment. And our, our clients are also becoming uh, more informed. So we wanna be able to expand the tools in our toolbox um, so we can be better students of the environment. And then it can also be a, and argued that we're positioning ourselves to have the knowledge and expertise that our, our clients are looking for. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our presenters today. We have Václav Hasek. Um, he's with he's the data manager at Building Transparency. It's a nonprofit organization behind the EC3 tool, which you'll learn more about today. Um, Václav was previously a sustainability analyst and life cycle assessment expert at Urban Fabric, where he managed projects pursuing LEED cert certification and helped teams address embodied carbon through whole building life cycle analysis. Uh, Václav also worked as a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, um, where he was involved in university-wide carbon accounting, sustainability planning, and research on data and methods for LCA of buildings. He's an active member of the Carbon Leadership Forum and founder of its San Francisco Bay Area Hub. We also have Chell Anderson, AIA lead fellow. He also practices architecture and serves as principal and director of sustainable design at LMN Architects, working with all of LMN's clients to set and exceed sustainable design goals. He wrote the first architect-centered book on energy modeling and has spoken extensively on energy, water and materials and embodied carbon. He founded the Seattle chapter of the Carbon Leadership Forum and serves on the AIA National Committee on the Environment and Washington State Building Code Council, where he chairs the Energy Code Technical Advisory Group. With that, I'm gonna hand this over to Václav to uh, get into the presentation and, uh, on embodied carbon. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's great to be here today and uh, share anything that I know, uh, you know, about embodied carbon on 
you know, in general and on projects as well. It seems like we are in the right place in terms of people interested in, in the topic um, and also, you know, interested in learning the basics as well as some of the practical steps uh, to addressing embodied carbon. So with that, I'll start with some overview of embodied carbon uh, in general. Um, then I'll hand it over to uh, Kiel for design process, uh, the discussion, and then I'll take it, take it over again for procurement and construction process discussion. With that, let me start with some basic overview of embodied carbon. Uh, Melinda has already mentioned, you know, the, the importance of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the recent I IPCC report, as well as some of the impacts uh, that we see uh, of, the, of the changing climate on a daily basis nowadays. And so I wanted to uh, connect this to, you know, how this links to buildings, building operations, as well as the materials that we put into buildings. So th there was this global CO2 emission uh, diagram done by the uh, Architecture 2030 a couple of years ago, uh, which shows the building operational uh, CO2 emissions uh, as well as the materials and construction CO2 emissions. And you can see that, that they account for about 40% of the total uh, global CO2 emissions on an annual basis. When we look at uh, a, an individual building uh, over its building lifetime on the right side, uh, we also see that we have two types of carbon emissions, right? The embodied ones with the materials and the operating emissions from uh, energy and natural gas consumption, et cetera. And with today's technology and with, uh, you know, uh, bu building energy modeling and some of the advanced technologies for envelope construction, et cetera, we actually have a good idea of reducing the operating emissions of new buildings specifically, uh, where we are actually able to construct net zero buildings on an operational uh, energy basis. But what has largely not been addressed is this embodied carbon emissions piece of the pie, which is what we are talking about today. We can also look at the embodied carbon emissions uh, from a different lens, from a different perspective, uh, where we don't look at just buildings, but manufacturing of products in general. And you can see that it's actually uh, even a larger piece of the pie than the 10% showed on the last uh, pie chart. And on this slide, you can also see which types of materials contribute the most to, to the global greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's in, it includes cement, iron, uh, different types of chemicals. But then you can also see that uh, there are all of these other types of products that are just covered on the, under the other category which still are significant at 32%. Now, why would you calculate uh, embodied carbon and why would you care about it other than that it's good for our planet? Uh, there are a you know, number of reasons nowadays. One is there are an uh, increasing number of policies around the country uh, and around the globe actually in, in trying to address embodied carbon and require some sort of disclosure of what types of materials are put into our buildings and infrastructure projects. We also have rating systems that address embodied carbon, uh, either through whole building life cycle assessment, which we will talk a little bit about today, uh, or by um, disclosing or, or procuring environmental product declarations, which we will, which we will also uh, cover a little bit later on today as well. So those are some of the main reasons why you would like to, you know, why you should care about embodied carbon uh, and how it can help you actually achieve some green building certification points as well. Now to some of the technical aspects of embodied carbon uh, on, on building projects, either on environmental product declarations or for a whole building life cycle assessment, it is typically done through a process of that, that you know, the process of LCA, which is called life cycle assessment or life cycle analysis. What that, what that process does, it basically looks at the greenhouse gas emissions as well as other types of emissions uh, throughout various stages of, of the life cycle of products. And a product can be an entire building as well, right? Building is, is, is consistent of a of number of uh, smaller products that are just, you know, put together in a big assembly. And so 
life cycle assessment looks at looks at the resource consumption and the direct emissions through each of these uh, life cycle stages. And then what you may see on reports or environmental product declarations is this global warming potential uh, parameter or, or, or uh, variable, which which is the equivalent of embodied carbon. It's 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 sort of a summation of all of the various greenhouse gases that contribute to uh, the greenhouse gas effect in global warming potential. Now, I mentioned life cycle stages. So what are they? Uh, the specifics are right on this slide. We have the product, construction, use, and end of life stages uh, depicted by the letters A, B, and C, respectively. Uh, we also have some uh, beyond aspects. So, so those are typically sort of just informational aspects related to life cycle as, uh, assessments. But you can also see that at the top, uh, you know, anything that's sort of on the on the top portion of this diagram is related to embodied carbon. So this is related to any of the materials that you put into your building. You can also see that each of the uh, larger life cycle stages has some sub stages. Uh, I think the most important ones to point out from an embodied carbon perspective are the raw material supply, transportation, and manufacturing impacts of products. We also have the construction and installation aspects, which are not actually as, as well um, tracked and known at this point, but it is something for, for contractors to, to definitely look into and, and sort of collect more data on. And then at the bottom of this diagram, we also have the operational uh, aspects of the energy use and water use that, that a building uh, has during its lifetime. Now, just to give you an idea of uh, how significant each of, these, each of these stages are, the product stage or the A stages are typically the largest piece of the pie for most of the materials. There are always, um, there are always some exceptions. There can be some materials that have larger emissions during the use phase uh, or even during the end of life disposal stage. It just depends uh, on what type of material it is and, and sort of what, what, what type of makeup uh, that material consists of. And so, so again, I would just like to drive down the point that the product stage is usually the largest piece of the pie. And there are some decisions that you can make early on in the design process as well as later on during uh, selection of, of products from different manufacturers where you can address embodied carbon during that stage. In terms of the material and system scope, uh, you know, people ask me this all the time, what sort of uh, products or, or parts of the building I should focus on. So this is, this is an overview of the current system uh, where most of the time the structure and enclosure elements are the minimum required um, uh, minimum required scope for life cycle assessment uh, and really for you know understanding the embodied carbon of buildings but there are also significant impacts from some interior products and so uh, there are various tools that now are expanding the data that helps you address the interior aspects of the building as well some smaller items such as hardware um, and 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 some of the more nuanced types of products like furniture can be a little bit tricky to address, uh, but it's definitely also important you know, to, to start addressing those as well, especially because we don't know, uh, we just don't know enough of how much they contribute to buildings at this point. Um, so I think that's it for this slide. And another sort of a detailed slide, how, you know, the, the details of how the carbon accounting works is, is, is very simple at its core. You know, you need the quantity of materials, the quantity of products that you're putting into your building, and then you need the impact factor or, or the uh, embodied carbon equivalent, equivalency factor. Uh, it's, it's very similar to, you know, cost estimating where you have the quantity of materials and, and you use uh, a cost per unit of a product. Except in this case, uh, we have we have impact factors for greenhouse gas emissions specifically. Uh, this is you know sort of uh, self-explanatory. I think where you get the quantity takeoffs is from your design, such as Revit model or you know Excel-based takeoffs. Where do you get your carbon data? It can be from environmental product declarations, but it can also be from uh, 
from tools designed specifically for this type of analysis. So later today, I'll, I'll cover EC3, which is the Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. Uh, but there are other tools that are more design focused, which I think Shell will mention uh, and, and cover as well. Some, some of these include the Athena, Impact Estimator, Tally plugin for Revit, one-click LCA, which is a web-based tool, but also allows for in, import of materials uh, and building models from other tools. And then eTool is not really North American based, but if you ever work on uh, Australian projects, that's another uh, whole building LCA tool for that region. And this is my last overview slides, uh, you know, just to, just to give you an idea of how each of these tools fit into the design process, uh, because each of these tools have strengths and weaknesses for certain types of analyses. So typically there are the design focused tools and the procurement focused tools. The design focused tools will have mostly generic data uh, and, and they are really focused on earlier phases of the design and help you understand the, the overall impacts of different shapes and sizes uh, of, of your building as well as just general location. Uh, they can also help you in comparing different types of systems. So, you know, system A versus system B, which uses some sort of combination of materials. But once you get to the construction documentation stage where it's time for uh, comparing products from various manufacturers, the generic background data is not going to be enough. And this is where, where tools like EC3, which focuses on manufacturer specific uh, data from product decorations, that's, that's where uh, you know, that tool steps into play and can help you in tracking the embodied carbon, the realized embodied carbon on a building um, for the as-built building as well. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kjell to talk a little bit about embodied carbon and design. Thanks, Vaxlo. Um, I'm gonna share my screen momentarily. Um, please put comments, make this lively. Um, you are welcome to unmute yourself or um, raise your hand or put anything in the chat if you want to say anything or have any questions or want to challenge what I'm saying. Um, whatever you want, I think it'll make it more interesting if uh, we if we interact a bit more. So I'm Chell Anderson. Uh, I'm a practicing architect, so I don't have um, the uh, either the credibility or the the weight of working for an organization that works on embodied carbon. So um, what I say will be the practical ways to get it done. Um, that's kind of where I focus. So we work on specs and, and construction documents and early designs, to try and make our projects better. So we did the poll. Here's some of the results of the poll. Um, uh, so you've heard it at a presentation before, now you've heard it twice. So. Um, some, sometimes things take three times to stick, so hopefully you go to another presentation. But hopefully out of today, a few more things will stick and you will be able to get into the, someone at my practice has worked on it and I have run an embodied carbon analysis. Um, that, would be, that would be great. Uh, I've worked in the energy modeling sphere. Uh, well, as an architect, I don't run that many energy models, but I, um, I coordinate lots of energy models and wrote a book on it. Um, I've worked on that and what I learned from that is if you click the buttons within the tools, you will learn a great deal um, more than if you just go to presentations on the subject. So um, yeah, ask any questions, uh, put it in the chat, whatever you wanna do. Um, there's a lot of entry points to Embody Carbon. It's now uh, part of the AI 2030. So hopefully most of you are on the AI 2030 have signed up for the commitment. Um, AI Awards, uh, they adopted the framework for design excellence, which was the Code Top 10 toolkit. And now that requires embodied carbon information. Um, so hopefully you're doing that. That will help you get awards during award season. It's the easiest lead points that we can get. Um, we can get one for just running an embodied carbon analysis and we get two more for reducing embodied carbon by 10%, which if we write the right specs and coordinate with structural and contractors, we will get those three points. Um, for basically free uh, for a little bit of coordination. Also doing your part in climate change is important and getting ahead of your competitors. We have seen many of our private clients who we have not expected to enter the embodied carbon sphere now ask us if we've heard of it. And 
when we have brought it up with them first, when we bring it up with our private clients and they then have an internal mandate to do something about it, they think, ah, LMN said something to this. We'll go and talk to them about this next project. Uh, so it's, it's extremely helpful as a competitive advantage in having brought, up, brought it up to our clients and maybe even worked on it on their projects without, even when they don't explicitly ask us to. A lot of this stuff can be done for free or, or extremely low cost. Um, the, the first level of it, you can go much further if you're willing to pay a dollar or two. So I'm not going to go through this because Voxlav went through it. Um, we do focus on the product stage, as uh, Voxlav said. Uh, it's the majority of the embodied carbon. Went through this. But the overlay I put on this is that building operations are going to take until 2050 to change if we retrofit lots and lots and lots of buildings between now and then with, um, with uh, better technologies for heating and cooling, uh, lighting and other things, and upgrade our electricity grid um, around the country. However, the building construction materials is uniquely specified on each project. So, you, so that could be reduced significantly uh, in a much shorter period of time. So this is from Payette, but if you have a code building, embodied carbon is, is a fraction of your, you know, a large fraction of your first 60 years of, of carbon emissions. If you include operational from energy use, and embodied. Um, once you have a high performance building, the embodied carbon becomes a much, much larger percentage of the emissions from your building. And once you consider over the next 10 years, we have, I don't know, 10-ish years to get to a more carbon neutral economy, according to the IPCC report. Um, once you consider that, you know, we have 10 years and the, the time value of embodied carbon is much more impactful now than it is later, then, embodied carbon reductions become the most important thing. In fact, in some cases, more important than the operational uh, energy use reductions that we've been chasing for four years. So how does this affect architects? Big, big, big global problems. How does this affect architects? We specify every material on a product, on a project, almost every material on a project. And if we don't specify it, it comes into our specs anyway through our consultants. So we are supposed to probably review um, all those specs, whether we do or not. Um, but we have a lot of control as coordinators of the built environment to review and control lots of specs, even well our own plus all all of our all the structural specs and, and mechanical specs and other things that might have significant embodied carbon impacts. So you look on this, and there's maybe 600 materials in this project, and we specify all of them. So. We need to own this problem. This is our problem as architects. This is not anybody else's. So what we can focus on, structural systems, our envelope and our interiors, and especially uh, fixtures, furniture, and equipment, those are all uh, important areas for us to focus now. Um, and coming soon, these are ones where we don't have the data yet. MEP and systems, we know that if we install a smaller system, it probably has a lower embodied carbon, but we don't know, we can't quantify it very well quite yet. Landscape and site, we also can't quantify that wet. Less concrete is better, but um, that, that's about as far as we can go. And then equipment is really difficult to know what the embodied carbon reduction of that is. Um, so we need to focus on those first three. Hopefully you've all heard what gets measured gets managed. If you begin to measure something, you will eventually start managing it. Um, it, and this, this is true in energy, and this is true in embodied carbon, and this is true across the entire spectrum of management. Um, so how do we measure it on a project that's in the design phase? Um, this is looking backward at whole projects. So LMN came up with an embodied carbon database. These are all of our um, the projects we had done as of a while ago. And you can see the total uh, global warming potential per square foot up here. And you can look at the, the lowest one, and you can look at the highest one, and then you can look at all the ones in the middle. And these are uh, by um, spec division right in here. Um, so you can see the embodied carbon of that. So this is how we've, we've used tally. Um, we have a, our process, we have a, a one tally expert at our firm who we developed as a tally expert, um, came into the firm not as a tally expert and is now leading our practice in that and um, supports lots and lots of other people to, to run tally on our projects. And we have a mandate to do this on all projects. 
Um, and we found that people can run Tally with just a few hours of instruction um, and coordination and touch points along the way. So it's not a difficult program to learn. Um, there are some tricky things and I'm happy to talk more about those, but um, these, so these are our results. So what, what could we learn about our lowest embodied carbon project? Well, this is a project at a university that used progressive design build and we were able to get mass timber and that was the biggest carbon embodied carbon reduction on it. We also reduced embodied carbon in concrete, which is another huge area, um, but it became a mass timber project. And that allowed us to reduce the embodied carbon by 58%. Now, anytime you talk about wood and embodied carbon, there's a lot of squishiness in the data. Um, I'm not gonna get into that today, but um, using the best data available, we estimated about a 58% reduction. So looking at our apparently worst project, what is it, what went wrong? In fact, it didn't, nothing went wrong. It's an aquarium. It has these large tanks that these, uh, these sharks and, and, and other animals are in. And it actually has a 43% embodied carbon reduction in the concrete. It just has a lot of concrete per square foot uh, because it has lots of tanks in it. And this is actually how we get it done on the embodied carbon front for concrete. We asked the contractor to come up with these, these mixes. Um, there's a PSI, there's uh, a tw uh, 28 days. Some of these are relaxed to 56 or even longer. Um, for instance, a mat slab and shear walls and other things sometimes. You know, who cares when, you, um, when it reaches full strength, uh, as long as it's before the building opens. Um, it could be 56 days, it could be 128 days, it, it could be much longer. So um, when you are able to reduce the, uh, uh, let's talk about concrete for a little bit. So in concrete, concrete contains cement. Cement is responsible for six or eight or nine percent of global uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, Barkov can probably correct me on that. Um, so anything you can do to reduce the cement content of um, concrete is extremely impactful. Um, so if you can use slag or fly ash or, or, or admixtures or anything else to reduce the cement content, you are winning in terms of embodied carbon. So um, what we did is we challenged our, our contractors to figure out where the mixed designs can, can uh, cure a little bit more slowly. So if you add slag or fly ash, what it does over about 25 to 30% is it um, it takes a little bit long, longer to reach full strength, but it, since you're using less water, it actually reaches a higher full strength than it would have otherwise using the same cement content. So if we can get a few areas of the product to relax their cure times, we can actually um, reduce the body carbon of our projects massively. Um, there's much more I could say about that, but I'm gonna move on. But with this one, it's 43% overall reduction from a baseline. So what can we learn about the middle ones? Um, they're all roughly in the same range. Um, the other thing is that concrete is significant even on steel buildings. So you can get significant uh, carbon savings with uh, steel buildings as well in the concrete areas of them. You can also do it on, on steel because steel is significant even in concrete buildings. So where are our biggest impacts? And I'm saying in the chat that reusing a building is great. Um, that's the way to win. And, and right now, I think yeah, I said that, that architectural buildings, 53% of architectural buildings are um, on existing buildings renovation, and that's great. Um, we have, you know, saving existing buildings saves a huge, huge amount of embodied carbon, and, and we should get credit for that within lead systems and other systems as well. Um, and one of the ways that we're going to have to move forward is figure out how codes can um, require operational carbon savings, but balance that with the idea that we're not, we don't want to tear down lots of existing buildings. Um, yeah, and uh, award programs, I, I, a couple of years ago, I think the, the Code Top 10 awarded, I don't know, it's two or three of the, the buildings were existing building renovations. Um, and that was great to see. Good comment, Bruce. So these are the big areas, concrete, steel, envelope, and interiors. Um, and so this is based on the same data that we, we had before all, uh, I don't know, 15 buildings or so. Um, and the aquarium was up here, of course, because it was uh, lots of concrete per square foot. So this is looking at just at one of our buildings and you can see the concrete and steel is a steel building um, are extremely significant. And you can also see that mechanical, uh, the initial TI, the envelope, and then 
core finishes uh, round out the, the total embodied karma of the project. Um, so the biggest win we can get with structure is to go with timber. And I feel confident saying that timber is almost always a better choice from an embodied carbon perspective than steel or concrete. How much better depends on um, a lot of data. And I said the data is a bit squishy. So, um, uh, but there are some considerations with mass timber. It's got some cost differences. And when I say cost differences, it's not the cost of the mass timber itself necessarily. It's often that there's different finishes um, that you would apply. You have columns that you don't need to wrap in chipboard. So maybe there's a cost savings there, but you have ceilings that are not gonna be, you know, full ceiling tile. So you save the cost of ceiling tile, but you have to put the acoustic treatment somewhere else. Um, so there's, and then there's different uh, base spacings for the grid if you're going with the ideal grid. And there's lots of options within mass timber. If you go with concrete, the mixed design is key. Work with your contractor and work with your um, supplier of concrete early or multiple suppliers of concrete and see what they can do. And you have to coordinate specs between division one and division three. And with steel, uh, the distance, the transportation method, and whether it is US-based or not. US-based tends to be lower embodied carbon than, than uh, foreign um, in terms of steel. So I saw this, Cleveland um, has the, is building the nation's largest mass timber project. So I don't know if anybody knows anything about that, but um, it, it's under construction. This is a picture of it. So awesome job. Looking at the envelope, I could say a lot, um, but Payette, if you go to their website right here, they have a tool that looks at the embodied carbon of various envelope types. Now, envelope isn't the most impactful thing, but it's something that we control greatly on our project. So, you know, for instance, using thin brick versus granite, this tool is saying that you can actually get some noticeable embodied carbon savings on that. Um, to Aaron's question, there is a way to assess the benefits from reusing existing buildings. I know there's a tool that's coming out, um, uh, uh, Siegel and Strain and others are working on a tool to assess that. Uh, you can also do that we, when we use do existing buildings, we use tally, and then we're able to assess what we're saving, what we're demolishing, and what we're maybe doing in addition to that. So it's, it's relatively easy to quantify once you use a tool. Um, you just model the building as it is, um, model what you're taking away, modeling what you're adding to it, and, um, and that's the way to do it. Um, but it takes some time to do that. I think uh, um, Larry Strain's coming out with that, and others are coming out with a, uh, a tool that will make it a little bit easier to do that. Uh, there's also rules of thumb. You can say that uh, you know, a, a building probably has uh, 400 to 500, um, based on the CLF study, uh, 400 to 500 kilograms, uh, of CO2e per, per square foot or square meter rather. So you can use that as a, as a basis and say, if we demolish this and build new, we're wasting that embodied carbon bank unless we reuse the materials and that. Um, other questions, wood construction in general reduce embodied carbon like mass timber? Yes, I'm gonna say yes. And I'm gonna say yes, probably significantly if you do it right, but there's so many caveats on there's a, an eight part session that CLF did on wood and, um, and embodied carbon. It's, it's a really complicated subject, but the answer is yes, comma, it depends. Um, we can talk about that more in the Q&A. So architects control the, uh, the insulation. And insulation is actually one of the most important things in the envelope for embodied carbon. Um, so, he, so using the EC through tool that Vaxlav is gonna talk about later, you can go and it's free, you can go in and say, ah, I want blanket insulation. Then you can look at the EPDs and then you can find out this particular one is, has this embodied carbon and you can compare it to other ones. And then you can also compare it to this, this green area is the average of all uh, insulations within this category. And this blue area is where this particular insulation at this manufacturing plant by this company, et cetera, is within this. So you could get five or seven insulations and you can compare them for embodied carbon. And as long as they're functionally equivalent, you can actually make a decision based on embodied carbon based on that. And the reason why insulation is important is because you know, blanket insulation, there's not a crazy amount of differentiation, but for, uh, for a rigid board, there's a massive difference between the worst uh, 
embodied carbon insulations and the best embodied carbon insulations. And that's based on the blowing agent. But if you look at the EPD, you can compare them fairly easily. And if you look at the mini EC3, you can compare them even more easily. So please go right now, sign up for an EC3 account and use it to compare materials, especially insulations, um, as if you're an architect. Okay, interiors is also, it's, it's ignored in lots of the uh, green building programs, but it's extremely important. Um, we did a study on our own office space, and this is our office space. Um, on our 2013 to 2015 uh, remodel, and this has been published in Metropolis Magazine and a couple other places. Uh, but if you look at this, 31% of it is carpet, 19% of, of, of it is the chairs that this guy is sitting on, uh, and 29% was the workstations. So right there, you don't need to look at anything else for interiors for right now. Um, you could look at drywall and stars, I guess, if you want. But look at your chairs, look at your carpet, and look at your workstations and see if you can find body carbon reductions in those areas. So, um, OK, so this is the rah, rah, rah part where I say, hey, go out and do it. And um, I will help. Um, and Vaxlav can help, and others can help. Find someone passionate to start it at your firm. Find someone who's interested in it. And they could be very junior, they could be senior, they could be mid-level. They need to learn a tool. That's probably the first thing they need to do. Attend a few sessions like this, maybe it's you. Learn a tool, click the buttons in the tool. You will learn so much by clicking the buttons in the tool because questions will come up in your mind. Like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then you can ask some great questions of people. Um, join a CLF regional hub. There is no regional hub in Ohio. There's ones in many other states and cities. So hopefully today we can find someone or multiple people to start the Ohio Regional Hub or maybe one in a city in Ohio. Um, focus first on concrete mixes um, and I help you walk through that if you want. It probably takes half an hour and we can walk through exactly what you need to do with that. I talked about it a little bit. Uh, model the corn shell at first. Um, curtain walls are really tricky to model and tally, but i um, gonna help you out there. Use EC3 to compare products like insulation, great. And require EPDs in your specs. That gets you a lead, another lead point um, in addition to other things. Uh, this is our tracking of how much stuff we've done over how much modeling we've done. This green one is energy modeling on a percent, as a percentage of our projects. This red one is embodied carbon modeling. And you can see we didn't, you know, we modeled our first whole building in 2017. And since then it's taken off and now we're modeling every project we have. It's been important to win projects and important to uh, impress our clients and important to meet our own ethos internally of, of reducing carbon on projects. Here's a regional hub. You can go there and, and start one. And you can see there's lots and lots and lots of them out there. Um, in that, I could answer a couple of questions or we could do them later. We, I don't want to get into wood now. I know Vaslav is, um, we can do that a little bit later. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing and um, if I can find the button for it. And uh, there's the button for that. Sheesh, I lost my buttons. All right, Vaxlav, you can just start, stop, start sharing and it'll stop me from sharing. How did that work? Is my screen on now? No. Not yet. Oh, my tools went. Uh, is it at the tab somewhere hidden? There it is. It's hidden behind my. There we go. All right. There you go. All right. All right, thanks. Thanks, Shell. Um, let's talk, let's continue the conversation and talk a little bit more about procurement and construction. And I'll, I'll go over uh, an example of the EC3 tool and how you can use it for addressing embodied carbon. Before doing all that, I wanted to start with a couple of rules of thumb, um, some of which have already been mentioned here. And I just wanted to show an example of uh, adaptive reuse project that I've worked on in the past. Uh, and we did, we used tally for uh, whole, building, whole building analysis of the building as a whole. 
uh, as as it was you know standing at the time before the the renovation uh, and you can see that the extraction and manufacturing was the majority of the new construction uh, impacts and it actually was primarily from the structural components uh, as well and so when we did the analysis of just the renovated parts of the building uh, where we considered the fact that some of the envelope and structural aspects were retained from the original building uh, we saw about 70 percent reductions in the embodied carbon just by reusing the structure and some of the envelope aspects and, and just so you know this building this was a building that was built in the uh, 1948 I, I believe in philadelphia and it was originally built as a beer bottling house uh, and it was it was uh, renovated to be an office building for an architecture firm so you can see that with reuse of, of buildings you can save you know, a ton of embodied carbon. And that's, you know, that's sort of the first rule of thumb that I always like to uh, drive home. There are a couple other rules of thumb uh, in terms of sourcing materials. Uh, Shell mentioned one of them in terms of, uh, you know, related to concrete and the fact that 90% of the carbon footprint comes from cement production. You can use supplementary cementitious materials uh, in your concrete to, to lower the carbon footprint of, of the concrete mixes. Uh, and it's probably the best to work with your concrete suppliers. This is probably done, uh, you know, it can be done during the design process, but also during the construction process uh, and, and see what, what will work for, for the timeline of the project that you're working on, as well as the performance specifications of, of the various um, concrete components. Addressing the embodied carbon and steel is a little bit trickier because the, the nature of the manufacturing of steel is slightly different. But generally, uh, we know that there are two main ways of, of manufacturing uh, steel. One is through the basic oxygen furnace um, production route, and the other one is through the electric arc furnace route. The electric arc furnace, because it uses larger amounts of uh, recycled scrap steel, and uses a different type of process, it actually uh, results in about 50% lower carbon footprint than the other steel making route. Now, if you're sourcing steel from the United States, it's mostly like most likely coming from the electric arc furnace, just because of the, the infrastructure that we have set up in the United States uh, is primarily based on that technology. If you're sourcing steel from, from abroad, I would be a little bit cautious about this because a lot of it comes from uh, the more intensive production route. But you know, now, now that we are getting more environmental product declarations, you can also start asking the suppliers for, for these documents to, to really understand the specific impacts of the steel that you are procuring on your own projects. And then the last big rule of thumb is related to insulations. So there are some types of insulations that are inherently uh, you know, higher embodied carbon based because they have high global warming potential uh, blowing agents within them. Now we've seen some of these uh, manufacturers also substituting these high global warming potential blowing agents with other alternatives, lowering the impacts of those installations, but it's always crucial to understand the, the actual impacts of the products that you're procuring. You can, in, in terms of insulations, you can, you can always consider some more natural based insulation products, as you can see on the, on the bottom side of this slide. Uh, generally, you know, na nature-based products are less intensive to manufacturers and can also have some sequestration potential during the, the product, you know, during the growth uh, of, of the feedstock materials, such as trees, uh, agricultural, you know, ag agricultural plants, etc. But it, it is a tricky topic. I think we may uh, discuss that a little bit more later on in the Q&A. In terms of uh, reductions through product choices, so there's a couple of ways that you can, uh, you can address embodied carbon. One is through specifications, as Shell mentioned. Uh, you can you can require manufacturers to, or at least ask manufacturers to provide environmental product declarations, which at least you know, now start helping you in, in disclosing and being transparent about the manufacturing practices of products. 
and actually give you some sort of idea of, of what type of impact a particular product may have. You can also, for some of the more uh, advanced products where we have many, many product declarations, you can start setting global warming potential limits or targets um, and, and put that right in the specifications. For concrete, uh, that can work. And we have some, some template specifications on our building transparency website. So if you go to buildingtransparency.org uh, and, and you go into some of the resources, uh, you will actually be able to find some sample documents. The other way uh, of addressing embodied carbon during procurement is, is through bidding. So providing, you know, again, requiring the provision of product specific environmental product declarations uh, and also uh, providing alternates for, for products that actually achieve the global warming potential uh, below a certain target. So you can, you can also do that. And then finally, you know, just generally tracking, as Michelle mentioned again, uh, you know, in order to be able to address this embodied carbon issue, we need to be able to understand where these impacts are coming from. And the first step to that is just calculating it in the first place and understanding, you know, where the embodied carbon of a building comes from. There's some other uh, construction-based opportunities, and that's related to tracking construction activities on a site. Uh, tracking the temporary construction impacts, which are not really addressed in the whole building LCA today, but they can actually be significant based on the type of materials that are used. And then lastly, packaging. So, um, you know, uh, looking for recyclable packaging or even looking for products that, that minimize the amount of packaging used uh, can also be one way to address body carbon. Now, I'll, I'll go over uh, the EC3 tool, which helps you uh, in finding environmental product declarations and actually you know, start understanding the relative global warming potential of, of various products from different manufacturers. The EC3 tool is free and open access tools tool. Um, and as I mentioned at its core, it's a database of environmental product declarations. It has some, some additional features that are meant to help you uh, in tracking environmental product declarations and the embodied carbon on, on projects overall. It's not just a search database. Uh, the tool was first published in 2019 and it was developed with over 50 industry partners. Uh, and we now have over 10,000 registered users. This is actually a couple months old, so I'm pretty sure that that number has grown as well. Uh, we have a couple ongoing partners that help us. You know, we are building transparency as a nonprofit organization, so we uh, work with partners and and you know donations. Uh, and so, you know, when we, we when we implement new features, we actually work with with partners that work on this uh, during design and construction on their own projects. Now that's. That's it for the background in terms of uh, building transparency and the EC3 tool and some of the rules of thumb. Uh, some of you have asked, you know, what is environmental product declaration? You may have never heard about it. Uh, it's, it's basically a nutritional label for the environmental impacts of a product based on life cycle assessment. So that's the process of analysis that I, that I covered early on in this presentation. It includes the performance characteristics and the explanation of the manufacturing processes uh, that, that a manufacturer you know, uses for these products. And these declarations also have to adhere to standardized rules and be verified. So the, the assessment that is done for these environmental product declarations um, you know, generally follows the same type of rules for, for similar product categories. Uh, and then you know, make, make sure that all of the calculations are as, as well aligned as possible amongst different manufacturers and different types of products. These can be multi-page reports, so it can be six pages, it can be 20 pages, uh, but there's this one part that's the most crucial one, and that's the table of the potential uh, impacts, which also includes global warming potential uh, as regarded as, as, as embodied carbon. So that's one of the places where you can look for embodied carbon information is, is on environmental product declarations. 
The number of EPDs over time has grown significantly, especially over the past few years. Uh, and so now we have over 30,000 EPDs in, in our EC3 database. Most of them are actually from, from the concrete industry, just because the concrete industry has been sort of ahead in adapting the environmental product declaration um, environment uh, and, and, the, and the process itself. We do have many others, you know, across finishes, uh, thermal and moisture protection, including insulations. Uh, we have steel EPDs, masonry, and wood EPDs as well. But you can see that on the right side of this diagram, we need some, some more work to do in terms of having manufacturers disclose this type of information. And so with you as a designer, you may ask yourself, well, what can I do? Again, just asking for this from manufacturers, that's the first step. When the manufacturers see that there's interest in understanding this topic, uh, they will ultimately invest in, in, in this and see it, you know, especially early on uh, as a market advantage as well over other manufacturers that don't necessarily um, analyze this kind of information. Now, EC3 uh, itself focuses on the product stages just because generally that's where the bulk of the impacts lie. So uh, this is just to stress that, that part as well again. And now we finally get into the interface of EC3 and how easy it is to find environmental product declarations for different types of uh, building products. So when you first open EC3, we are really focused, you know, you, you will see some, some basic diagrams and statistics that I actually showed in the previous slides about the amount of uh, environmental product declarations we have across different categories. The next step will be on the left side menu. Uh, there's two main features. One is to find and compare materials and the other one is to plan and compare buildings. Find and compare materials is the basic interface to help you find environmental product declarations. The plan and compare buildings interface then lets you uh, assign material quantities and actually track, uh, you know, EPDs and the embodied carbon on a whole project basis. So to start finding and comparing materials, so you simply select the product category from from the tree that you see here, and you click on the next button. And that will take you to the search properties, um, which, which includes the performance specifications, geographic information, and some additional filters that you can use, for example, for looking for specific manufacturers. This particular uh, slide is showing an example from, uh, from the concrete ready mix category. And so you can see performance specifications specific to concrete, such as compressive strength, uh, slump, there are different options for, for supplementary cementitious materials. You can also select if it's a standard weight or a lightweight concrete. Uh, and then in the geographic information, you can select a particular state or, or general region around the globe. If you're working in a, inside of a building project and you actually select the location of your project, you can also search by the radius from that address. So once you select all of your performance criteria, you know, in, in the search filters, you can click on the search button uh, and you will get a list of, of all of the environmental product declarations that fit that criteria. I don't have the whole list uh, shown here, uh, but you can select individual EPDs and put them side by side for, for comparison of, of the global warming potential of these products. So in this case, I have Six, um, six different concrete mixes that are shown here on the right side of the diagram. And then I also have the category statistics. So this includes all of the EPDs that fit your filter criteria uh, and, and the overall statistics of this, of this material category are shown on the left side as well for, for reference. And so this is really the, the main way that you can start looking for EPDs and then comparing them on their embodied carbon basis. Now, when we start talking about the building planner, you know, how can you use the EPDs to actually quantify the overall project global warming potential? So I, I mentioned earlier, you need the material quantities, right? So you can get that either from Excel-based estimates from, from the contractor, they are doing a cost analysis, 
but you can also import uh, models through the BIM 360 interface, or if you're using Tally and you already do early design analyses, you can export the project into EC3 from Tally. And once you import it into EC3, this is what the interface looks like. It's, it's based on uh, an idea of a spreadsheet, right? Where you have the, uh, the type of product or, or the components on the left side here, and you have the quantities in the middle, uh, the units, and on the right side, you have the uh, embodied carbon information in kilograms of CO2 equivalent. In terms of searching or, or assigning materials to these material quantities, you would click on this add button next to each of, ne next to each of the elements. And then all, all it will show is the same interface that I showed a couple of slides earlier in terms of looking for environmental project equations. You select a particular EPD or even just the general search filters uh, and you can assign it to your particular element in the building. Once you, you know, once you collect all of the information for your entire building, you can uh, look at a number of graphical ways of analyzing your data. We have this lead bar chart, which shows you uh, the, the categories that are related to the lead pilot credit for embodied carbon. Uh, and it shows you the CLF baseline values, which are set by the carbon leadership forum for each product category as well as the realized values, which is related to the product specific environmental product declaration that you selected for your project. Another way of looking at the data is through Sankey diagrams. And this may be a little bit confusing to you if you haven't used Sankey diagrams before, but if you go into our tool, we also provide um, some basic information on, on how to read Sankey diagrams, as well as what type of data it's, it's showing you. So even if you're in the tool for the first time or you forget, uh, look for the tour uh, links and it will show you, you know, it, it will explain some of this information again. In general, uh, I'll go over this fairly quickly, but on the left side, we have the individual material types that I selected in my building and then I assigned quantities for. And all the way on the right side, I have the total impacts of my building. Uh, so in this case, it was 2.4. 5, 5 million kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Uh, now, the one thing that I wanted to, or a couple of things that I wanted to point out uh, on this diagram is you can see which, which, which um, assemblies within the building the impacts are associated with. So superstructure, enclosure, roofing, interior construction, et cetera. And it also shows you this, uh, this S line which is the selected materials. So I selected a particular envir environmental product declarations. And the S line shows me where that particular product falls in, in comparison to the general category as a whole, considering all of the different manufacturers of products in that category. You can also see the, the, the solid part of the bar chart. And you can see the sort of the hashed a part of the bar chart. What this means is that the solid part is the minimum, or it's it's the it's the lowest that you know majority of the market can can uh, the lowest global warming potential that that manufacturers can probably provide you in the general market. There may be some exceptions, as you can see. I selected some lower EPDs in this case, but generally the market will fall somewhere around the the solid part of the bar. If you look at the conservative scenario where you don't really look for global warming potential uh, reductions at all, most manufacturers will probably land somewhere around the top of the, of the hashed bar. And so you can see that there's a significant difference just by selecting the type of product from, from a specific manufacturer. Now you can also uh, export results uh, in an Excel format, which I don't have shown here, but that is one good way of actually documenting reductions and providing that to entities like USGBC for, for lead certification. And, and with that, I'll go to a couple of resource slides. These are my last two slides. Um, 
One of them is these, this, this new resource that we have on our buildingtransparency.org website, uh, which is called the Embodied Carbon Action Plan. It's actually uh, an interactive diagram uh, focused on different stakeholders during the design process of a building. Uh, and it shows you, you know, sort of what, what types of things you can do yourself uh, to, to influence the embodied carbon of a building and to influence the reduction uh, decisions. So hopefully you can see my actual uh, live screen right now. You can hover over any of these parts of the diagram and it will give you the type of steps, the key actions that a person can take. Uh, and it gives you additional resources and links uh, that will give you more information on specifics related to your sort of to your responsibilities uh, as the different stakeholder in the process. So that's one of the uh, one of the resources I wanted to mention. Now let me switch back. The last slide that I had, I can get to it. Last slide that I had is if you have questions about EC3, um, you can again go on buildingtransparency.org. We have video tutorials that help you get started with the tool. We also have the model LCA specifications and sample bid documents that you can find there. And then in terms of Tally, which we recently took, took over development and maintenance of Tally as well, you can go to choosetally.com. And it has plenty of tutorials and additional resources uh, related to the design aspects as well. And then lastly, I would just like to encourage everyone to join the Carbon Leadership Forum. And definitely if you are interested in starting an Ohio chapter, you know, that would be a great next step as well. And that's it for my presentation here. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for your great presentation, Vasquez and Kel Chell. Um, with that, we kind of, oh, I know there's been a lot of questions in the chat. I don't know, Chell, if there's anything that you or, that you or Vatslav want to elaborate on that has come up thus far, or if there's anyone that would like to unmute themselves and ask a question. I'm happy to answer any extremely technical questions or or broad questions about things. We could, we could dive into the wood conversation if, if somebody really wants to go there. Um, on that, but I, I would love it if, if I think we would all love it if somebody wanted to start a, a CLF Ohio or, or some other chapter with, with, with support from others around here. Um, if, if this has piqued your passion and you want to um, get other people together, what we've done in Seattle. Um, so both Vaxlav and I have started chapters and we did in Seattle is I just gathered five or other people. Actually, I just started it by myself, but I emailed a bunch of other people and said, hey, would you be interested in this? And then I just booked speakers that I had seen speak at other CLF uh, chapters and got reached out to other people who were um, conversant in it. And that was great. And then I also got a bunch of people together. And the first session was just brainstorming. What do we know? What do we not know? And then we scheduled out the first three or four months based on actually the first six months based on that brainstorm and um, then reached out and got speakers in it. It's been great in the Zoom world as well to, to do that. Um, we record all our sessions. You can also, um, so we have a YouTube channel as a lot of the CLF chapters do. Um, so you can record things or, you know, at first we didn't record it so that it would be um, more conversational. But as soon as we went remote, then it <laughs> became a different different animal. Uh, so now we record them all. But is there anybody who wants to raise their hand and, 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 and uh, start said chapter or ask a question? I have a quick question. If if there's no other ones, I'll start it out. But um, were there any materials, I guess, when you first started looking at this that really surprised you from either their overall contributions or just a disparity between manufacturers of the same material? Well, you know, how much different one was versus the other? 
installation was probably the big the big early one for us was you know hey if we do a an XPS wall versus a mineral wool wall there's a big 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 difference in there and even between manufacturers of of those blown products um, the the blowing agent is is massive in the total global warming potential so that's something that we learned um, early and then. The other thing is we went to Greenbuild a couple of years ago and we handed out four EPDs for carpets to groups of eight people or 10 people. And they got 15 minutes to figure out was there one with a lower global warming potential than the others. And so these are you know 15 page, 30 page documents and they had four of them or three of them. And we also handed out three or four of them on a chair to other groups. And in the end, it was very difficult for people to read the EPDs and decide was one better than the other. And there are lots of questions that came out of that, which is why it's important to read these things and why the EC3 tool is great because it actually takes in the data and applies a data confidence to each product. And if, the, if there was less confident data, it assigns a more conservative or a wider range for that. So it's actually the, the global warming potential that you see in an EPD is different than what you see in an EC3. And the reason is that data conference. So that even within carpets, carpets is also another huge one that kind of surprised us as to how important it is. Yeah, I think I think same for me in terms of the insulation. It's definitely a product. You know, people always think of the structural materials, but there can be certain types of insulation that I think actually early on we were sort of overlooking in terms of their impact just because of the blowing agents that were in them. Uh, and, and that is just a good example of what happens when you, you know, start looking at the data, start analyzing it, and actually bring it up to the, to, the, to the people who make the products, and they can actually do something about it on their, on their own front. The, the other thing that I, that I think I would uh, point out is that a lot of people get intimidated by you know, I have to do an analysis. This is going to be super complicated, but actually it's quite simple. You know, it's sort of like uh, cost estimating in terms of just having the quantities and having, you know, like I mentioned, the embodied carbon factor. Where it does get a little more tricky is actually understanding the different types of products uh, and, and, and actually, you know, sort of understanding their impact, right? And the only way that you can do that is by looking at uh, you know, something like environmental product declarations or even the generic data that, that um, regular LCA tools have. A lot of you as architects do deal with materials on a regular basis. So you are the expert on, the, on, on a lot of these, you know, material-based topics. It's just another sort of perspective that you need to take in your own decision-making process during design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when we started modeling, um, we found that people with three years of experience that haven't really worked with specs at all um, or much struggle a bit more than people with 10 years experience that have, that have worked with specs and understand the different divisions and the different bits that go into the specs and all the complexity of a three-part spec. So um, I think when you do, if somebody starts modeling and they're one year into their career in architecture, they need the help of somebody with probably eight or 10 years experience to help them understand what they're actually looking at and what is functionally equivalent to what, you know, what kind of kind of concrete do we have? What kind of wall assembly do we have? That kind of thing. I actually have a question related to specs. I know you guys mentioned there's sample specs and kind of some um, ways to incorporate these strategies into your specs, but do you find that it's, hard to have, I guess, a competitive spec when you're targeting uh, a certain um, embodied carbon reduction? So I can go for that one. Um, so if you use the CLF baselines from 2021, 80% um, of the products out there in that category are probably better than that. So it's not, you're not, you're not cutting out, you're cutting out the worst, but not, 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 um, not that many. Um, okay. So that's not, not so bad. Um, with concrete, uh, it, you know, it's, it's it, most suppliers just have mixed numbers and they can uh, supply whatever you require as long as the contractor um, and the structural engineer are okay with it. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's easy. Um, it's, it's, it's really difficult to specify 
a lot better than the CLF baselines because then you do start cutting out products. You do need to then, if you specify three products or something, you need to make sure that they actually comply and then you can set that target. Um, so it takes a little bit more effort to, to kind of get better than the CLF baselines if you're gonna write a GWP number into your specs. And, and typically we're not, we're not yet writing a GWP number in our specs for anything but concrete and a couple other products. Uh, we're primarily just researching better carpets and then writing those as our carpets into the, into the spec. And then and they will be bid. And when somebody comes out with an alternate, we need to make sure that whoever's doing construction administration um, knows why we picked those three. And so they don't go with a substitution that um, removes the, the research that we did. Yeah, I, th I think it was definitely, there was time a couple of years ago when we were trying to compare to industry averages. And that's where it was even more difficult to come up with products that complied with any sort of global warming potential limits. But I think with the Carbon Leadership Forum baselines, which really focus on sort of the 80th percentile of the market, it sets a much better starting point for a lot of manufacturers to actually comply with any requirements and specifications. So just make sure, you know, if you are acquiring, you know, if you're looking at limits for specific product categories to use the Carbon Leadership Forum baseline as your starting point. I see that Edward, you have your hand raised. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I, I had a couple of questions. One, just on the billing envelope on, um, you know, re continuous insulation has been kind of the push to get the insulation further out and to prevent thermal breaks. You know, so on a recent project used a poly iso oil faced and no, you know, all the insulation was outside the stud actually eliminated the sheathing. So essentially reducing product um, and increasing the energy performance, but the polyiso may have a uh, high global warming potential just by itself, but you're reducing product. So it may balance out. Um, thoughts on that type of assembly. And the same with the roof, you mentioned using mineral volume of roof. I'm curious about that. And then the, the other question is about the, you know, how much effort is involved in the uh, carbon leadership um, group. I mean, that's probably why people are reluctant to <laughs> immediately sign up. <laughs> Everyone's buried with their you know, day job, but. Yeah, so I think those are, and then, so three three questions in there, wall, poly ISO. Um, so, we typically use mineral wool in our wall assemblies, but using poly iso is not as different all in than, um, than mineral wool. And it's still a good thing to do because when you put better insulation in your walls, uh, assuming it's not a highly glazed building, it's not like an 80% glazed building or something, um, assuming that it saves a lot of energy and reduces your peak heating and cooling loads, uh, that extra insulation in your walls reduces the mechanical embodied carbon because it reduces the size of your mechanical system, the, the, the size of your air handling units, the size of your ductwork, all the hangers, all that stuff, all that metal you don't, now don't need in your building because you've reduced your peak loads by 15% or 20% or 30% or something like that if you design your building uh, well. So now you've, you've, you've increased the embodied carbon in your wall but you've reduced your overall embodied carbon and your operational carbon. So it's generally a win. It's almost always a win to put more insulation in your walls, especially in an extreme climate that has lots of heating days and lots of cooling days. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for the first question. Second one is um, we don't use mineral wool with coverboard on our roof. It's a possibility. We looked at it and we found that poly iso versus mineral wool with coverboard were roughly equivalent in terms of embodied carbon. And the mineral wool was deeper, which required a higher parapet and required its own embodied carbon analysis. So in the end, we decided to keep going to poly iso with that and just get the best poly iso we can. And then how much time does it take to start the CLF uh, Ohio or whatever? You know, it's it's finding one presentation a month. Um, you know, it's probably four hours of emailing people and, and coordinating things and six hours maybe. 
and then obviously attending the session. That's that's what it's taken on my end for the CLF Seattle. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Doug, if you, I see you've got your hand raised, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned carpeting, and I was thinking about other materials in the building uh, that are mostly going to be finishes that are potentially going to be replaced for various reasons, whether it's remodeling, whether it's just a new tenant, whether it's, um, I just don't like this carpet anymore. Um, how does that play into the issue of life cycle cost and replacement costs and, and making your initial selection versus uh, something that will overall the life of the building? Yeah, and that's, that's one of the biggest variables that we are kind of struggling with as an architecture firm within uh, our analysis is 60 years. You know, it uglies out before it wears out often with interior materials is what uh, our interior designers say. So some clients of ours replace their interiors every seven years or every five years, perhaps. And in, in uh, tenanted buildings, sometimes that happens very frequently. In university buildings, often it's less frequently because they can't get the funding to do it. Um, Tally has assumes things will be replaced on a certain cycle. Carpets might be, I don't know, 10 years. Um, drywall in certain instances, 15 or 20 years. Uh, mechanical systems in 45 years or something like that. So we, we look at that and we see how, how much we believe in that based on the product and sometimes change that um, in the post-processing. Uh, but that's, that's a detailed thing. Um, so, and those are reflected in the B categories in the EPD. So Voxlog can probably talk more about that, but we do, then this gets into the whole demo spec thing. Architects generally have really lousy demo specs that only require a contractor to <laughs> take everything to landfill. Um, we can have much more nuanced demo specs that require carpet take back programs and um, ceiling tiles can be taken back and refurbished. There's many pieces of a project that can actually be refurbished. Right now it's not free uh, to do so, but we can we can be more diligent in our demo specs uh, when we do that. And that's when during a new building we're tearing down something that's existing. And also in our TIs when we're you know refitting a building. Vaslav, you can yeah, add something. Right, right. I, th I think you covered most of it. I think um, just generally for the specifics about life cycle assessment on a whole whole building perspective. So Shell mentioned 60 years. These analyses are typically done for a 60 year building lifetime. And there then tools like Tally do have some default values for the replacement times of various products uh, that are taken into account over that 60 year lifetime. Environmental product declarations also have what's called the reference service life disclosed on them. Um, and, and the reference service life is typically specified in the rules for that particular category. So it may not necessarily exactly uh, describe, you know, sort of the performance-based lifetime of a particular product. So it is a little bit nuanced. You do need to, uh, you know, probably look into warranty periods uh, and, and sort of the uh, precedence for the use of, of products for a particular application and, and see what the, what the uh, expected lifetime of that product would be for your particular use case. It's definitely one of the more tricky aspects of life cycle assessment. Are there any other questions? I have a quick one for Vatsklav. Um, my firm uses the uh, the program Archicad. Is there any plans for um, developing a tool like Tally that interfaces with Archicad, like it does with Revit? Yeah, uh, don't have any specific plans for that yet. But we do, you know, recently we have heard more interest in in a tool like that. Uh, it hasn't been on our radar just because of the, the volume of users that we have from, from, from some of the other tools. But, you know, it's definitely, if we can make it easier for people to 
to use tools and address this type of topic. We do want to make sure that we help those people out. Um, so I think even though we don't have any specific plans for it yet, uh, it's I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's not definitely not going to happen in the next few years. It might. I, I think uh, you know one click LCA I believe can have an import from from Archicad. Okay. I have not used that tool myself a whole lot. Uh, but but you might you know it might be worth looking looking into if you're looking for alternatives. Great, thank you. Well, I think we're getting close to our hour and a half. So if there's, I'm kind of scanning to see if there's any other questions. I don't see any uh, hands raised. So I just want to thank you both for this amazing presentation. Um, also, thanks to our sponsors and for all of you for attending. Um, don't forget to sign up for our next workshop in two weeks. Um, and then as Chell and Vatsklav mentioned, if there's anyone interested in starting a Carbon Leadership Forum uh, Ohio or City Center, um, please email Kate and we'll connect everybody so that we can get that um, coordinated. So again, thank you all. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Hi, thanks, everybody.